and welcome to the first full day of the International Degrowth Conference here in Leipzig. My name is Matthias Schmelzer and I will be facilitating the two keynotes this morning. Um, we hope that you all had a good night and a good breakfast and are as excited as we are to start with the conference. However, before that, I have to say some more general things from our organizational team. Um, the first thing is about interpret uh, interpretation. Also, Übersetzung auf Deutsch ist auf Kanal 1. Um, la Interpretation uh, al Español ist da disponible in den Kanal 3. And all the talks will be given in English, so nobody needs to translate into English, which is normally on channel 2. Um, and the second thing is, we need more helpers uh, to help in organizing this uh, conference and making it run smoothly throughout these days. Just to give you an idea, just today we um, are planning um, and need 200 helpers during the day. And if you haven't already done so, please go to the helpers desk right outside this hall and sign up for a shift. Um, we need especially people in the mornings. So tomorrow morning at 8 would be a very good time if we need more people. Um, normally shifts are 4 hours, but you can also sign up for 2 hour shifts if 4 hours seems too much. As you may have already recognized, this conference is special in many different ways. One of these is that the conference brings together diverse people, discourses and practices. Not only researchers from the various different academic disciplines, but also practitioners who are already living the Nautopias beyond growth, activists and organizers who are fighting and to change the political and social power structures, and artists and performers and musicians. This overlap has many potentials. That's why we invite you to this great experiment of cross-fertilization and collaboration and learning. But it also has some dangers. <laughs> if we are not cautious to respect the different needs and rationalities of these different groups. So we ask you to be, please be very respectful of the various formats of this conference that are clearly marked in the conference program. Because the scientific paper session and just the same thing as a workshop. Also, we have tried to avo avoid organizing yet another conference um, that most people only attend as cons consumers, and in which these different groups don't really meet together and discuss. Thus, every day in the afternoon, from 5 to 7 p.m., we have reserved for the, interpret the interactive formats at which Academics, practitioners, activists, and artists meet together. In this time slot, everyone is invited to participate in one of, of two interactive, participatory, and inclusive forms of debate. The group assembly process and the open space. And because there have already been so many questions on these kind of weird words, I just want to like say very shortly what they are and give you a, a hint how you can get involved. So what's the group assembly process or GAP? It's a three-day working process of collective and democratic consensus building of the degrowth movement. And it aims at developing concrete proposals for the transformation towards and the shape of degrowth societies, at mapping also existing areas of disagreement, and at listing research questions and ideas for action. It will be held in small thematic working groups um, of people with some experience in their particular field. To enable a fruitful and well-prepared discussion, only people, with, um, only people who have already registered before the conference in these working groups um, are invited to participate and all the working groups are unfortunately full. But don't worry if you have not registered, every, everyone is invited to co comment on the intermediate um, results of the working groups, which will be um, presented in the, at the Gap Info point outside um, in the foyer of the Audimax. And also the results were presented on the last day on Saturday. If you do not take part in the group assembly process, you are very welcome and invited to participate in the open space. Open space is a place where you can put your own ideas and topics into practice. It is open to all participants and you are invited to submit any kind of event you would like to be at. The open space is an integrative part of the conference and with 
space for 50 or maybe also 100 working groups who will be meeting at the same time, this could become one of the largest open spaces ever. If you want to create your own open space group, you can submit your, your topic either online or at the open space info point, which is also right outside, um, if you go outside to the right. Um, please submit your topic for a particular day before 1.30 p.m. So after the session, there's only um, two and a half hours time to submit a topic for today's open space. If you just want to participate, if you look up the program, which will be published each day at 4 p.m., either online or also at the information desk. For, for a more detailed introduction to the open space process, um, you can um, come to this room at 5 p.m. and there will be a more detailed introduction how it works. And due to this introduction, the open space today will only start at quarter past five. So um, let's get to the keynotes. Each day will open with two keynotes um, each 40 minutes that address the narrative step of each day and one of the three thematic threads. Unfortunately, there will be no time for questions during or after the keynotes. However, all the speakers will be present during the entire conference um, and you can either discuss the issues in the coffee breaks with them or at var various um, formats and um, events during the conference on the issues raised in both keynotes. Today we decide to start with the analysis and critique of the multiple crisis we are facing. Not only economic, eco ecologically, as we heard yesterday in the keynote, but also economically, socially, politically, militarily and culturally. We have done so because our ut utopias have to grow out and be informed by the ongoing crisis and the various movements of resistance. Our first keynote will focus on the results of, one could, of what one could maybe provocatively call um, the actually existing degrowth within capitalist social and economic structures. It will dis discuss the situations southern European countries are, like Greece are facing in the context of the Euro crisis and the, crisis and the authoritari authoritarian austerity measures in Poland and uh, the European growth motor Germany. From these we can learn that when GDP decreases within capitalism, this generally leads to rising unemployment, a youth without perspectives, a situation in which many cannot afford food or medicine, um, increasing racism, and generally a destruction of those social infrastructures that are necessary for a degrowth society. However, as we will hear in our keynote, crises are also opportunities for transformation and change, and open up possibilities for organizing societies from below in a different and better way. We are very glad that we could thank Haris Constatatus for this keynote. Haris is a political scientist and PhD candidate at the Department of, the, of Geography at the University of Athens. He's also a member of the Central Committee of Syriza, the left-wing political party in Greece that, quite specially for a political party, has maintained powerful links with the social movements fighting austerity in Greece. Harris will be talking about the social ecological crisis as a crisis of democracy, the view from southern Europe. So let's welcome um, Harris Harris. Arriving late, it would be nice if all the people could squeeze in a little to fill in the spaces that are still free um, in the middle of the rooms.
Thanks a lot, uh, Matthias, for, for this uh, warm uh, welcome. I'm very honored uh, to be here to give uh, this uh, speech and uh, most of a bit uh, nervous. Uh, but, uh, and I take this invitation, uh, as Matthias said, not only as a researcher but uh, as an active political person uh, in Greece working in uh, environmental issues uh, since many years since uh, maybe the like golden age of the Olympic Games of Athens uh, 10 years ago or something, um, and active in the political uh, left uh, in Greece. Um, my speech uh, necessarily is positioned and informed by the fact that I come from Greece, uh, which is uh, hit hardly by the actually existing uh, the growth, their austerity, as Matthias uh, said. Um, so, uh, my presentation consists of five parts. Uh, very briefly, in the beginning, I will propose that it's valid to approach the present situation of the crisis from a geographical and a specific Southern European point of view. And that very all, briefly also, secondly, refer to the radical readings of the crisis that come from a left and ecological perspective. But I, I suppose this is common sense to, to many of us. Uh, then uh, I will mostly focus on the political aspects of the crisis and the related uh, crisis of democracy and uh, uh, the legitimation of dominant uh, narratives. Uh, I will go on to present the alternative routes, the dominant and the alternative ones that are being proposed as ways out of the crisis. And finally, I will try to draw some conclusions and pose some questions that I believe are, uh, and I hope, are uh, relevant for the agenda uh, of this conference. The dominant explanations of the crisis are mainly financial, but its geographical causes and spatially differentiated effects are often neglected. But it's said that capitalist uh, development and its crisis are contested and must be analyzed in the context of particular social formations and not in the abstract. So several radical scholars have recognized that uneven geographical development is an important component of the current capitalist crisis that started from the US and spread glo globally, only to took various forms depending on local conditions and on the form of economic and political integration of its country and region into international division of labor. So here I propose a, a context and geographical specific reading of the, of the crisis, not a generic uh, reading. In that sense, I adopt a Southern European perspective to approach the crisis, although I want to point our attention that we should not, we should be careful not to assume a Southern peculiarity. Uh, there are several common characteristics to Southern European countries that differentiate them, them from the rest of EU, the core of EU, in terms of their different productive system, different economies, uh, and a different structure of the state um, and administration. Those characteristics, uh, although in nominal GDP terms, the last 30 years of Spain, Greece and Portugal's accession in the EU supposedly converged, I and many other critics say that uh, uneven geographical development remained during those 30 years a key feature of the continent. So, Special features of the economy and politics of the Southern European countries must not be considered as exceptional cases, but rather as variants of the dominant capitalist model of development. On the other hand, countries of Southern Europe do have certain commonalities in political histories and socioeconomic structures that need to be reevaluated today since they form the in inescapable context for societies to deal with the challenges posed. Many radical scholars argue that the causes of the crisis are strongly connected to the neoliberal settlement 
uh, of the 70s, which itself was a response to the global overaccumulation crisis of capitalism. That crisis has been diverted to involve even more peoples and territories, and compared to the Asian and Argentinian economic shocks of the 90s and early 90s, today's crisis has impacted all the core capitalist countries. But apart from the uneven patterns of capital accumulation that are identified as a structural cause of the crisis, not enough attention has been paid to environmental and resource factors. I suppose this is common sense to all of us, that the profound character of the crisis, the profound ecological character of the crisis, represents the final limits and challenges the very basis of capitalism. So we should avoid monocausal explanations and seeking the single underlying cause of the crisis. The nature of the crisis can vary through time and across space. And maybe it's more useful to think about the current crisis as a conjuncture, a period when different social, political, economic and ideological contradictions come together and are being condensed in the same historical moment. For the purposes of this presentation, I will mainly focus on the political aspects of the crisis, which are also subject to geographic variation. Since its beginnings, neoliberalism sought to protect the market from unnecessary political influence and democratic overload through a technocratic turn in decision making. A retreat, a hauling out of democracy came with the abolition of existing participatory institutions and the recentralization of power to the elites. Many scholars refer to such developments as a post-political neoliberal order, characterized by a climate of consensus among dominant groups, politicians, business, NGOs, and experts, characterized also by suppression of dissent and exclusion of people from governance, which only serve the interests of global capital. This post-political order has resulted in a widespread alienation of the masses from politics, declining levels of political participation, the rise of, the, the rise of corruption, and the growth of far-right political forces. Especially after the outburst of the crisis, authoritarian governments and unelected technocratic policymakers rejected even modest proposals stemming from the losers of austerity, for example, on a re-regulation of the financial system. After the initial shock, elites convinced themselves that soon there would be a relatively smooth return to the status quo ante. This lack of plasticity exacerbated further the democratic deficits at the national and at the EU levels. The lack of uh, legitimacy of neoliberal capitalism and the growing crisis of political representation were clearly illustrated by the social movements of resistance uh, of the squares or the indignados. Those movements, those collectives of resistance, in some, in some way managed to reappropriate the democratic mantle I will refer to these uh, aspects uh, of those movements a little bit later. Now I want to, to highlight that crises result in a fundamental instability of the political and its re renegotiation. The consequences of the deep crisis will most probably transform deeply the political landscape in European countries, although of course it's not predetermined what the outcome will be. But I think we must agree with the no turning back thesis. It is unlikely to return to the period of neoliberalism as experienced before 2008, even more to the golden post war years. The, golden. the resolution to the crisis will either be in the direction of a far more authoritarian capitalism, as in the plans to constitutionalize fiscal conservatism and turn Southern Europe into a vast reservoir of cheap labor, or, to, or towards transcending capitalism in some important dimensions. As the Marxist thinker Antonio Gramsci wrote one century ago, 
crisis creates a terrain more favorable to the dissemination of certain modes of thought and certain ways of posing and resolving questions. Today, it might provide opportunities to intellectually escape from dominant narratives and promote radical sociological paradigms, paradigms uh, such as environmental justice or the growth. It is to those post-crisis alternatives, the dominant one, the dominant and the oppositional ones, that I will try to, to present to you in the following section. <coughs> in the context of the crisis, schematically three models, with the danger to oversimplify it, are being formulated as solutions by different socio-political actors. We can name them as aggressive neoliberalism, progressive productivism, and sociological transformation. I will go to each one uh, trying to present them. The imposed developmental paradigm for Southern Europe nowadays, aggressive neoliberalism, is based on a double devaluation both of labor and environmental commons. The imposed devaluation of labor and the social crisis that it's causing uh, is an aspect well known and analyzed. Less, and less attention has been paid to the catastrophic consequences of austerity and economic adjustment on the environment. What we are seeing nowadays is the elimination of all provisions for environmental protection, weakening of the already poor in Mediterranean countries environmental governance and spatial planning framework. We are seeing that ecologically precious areas, coasts and forests are being threatened by large-scale investments. And comparable trends of a loss of our environmental acquis uh, and the fall of the quality of life in order to stimulate development can be identified in all other countries of South Southern Europe. In a recent study sponsored by Greek industrialists and bankers, it is proposed that the new growth strategy for economic development for the next five to ten years will be funded on, will be founded on competitiveness, productivity, extroversion, investment stimulation and employment opportunities and on specific economic sectors which offer the possibility of significant growth based on the international dynamics of supply and demand, so no domestic demand, this implies. Behind the report's nice wordings lies the well-known idea that the poor sell cheap. Greece is considered as a resource rich but indebted and weak state, so new opportunities for transnational capital are presented, especially in the sectors of mass tourism, energy and extractive industries. In parallel, we witness the implementation of a policy of privatizing public, public assets in all crisis hit countries. With Greece planning a fire sale of state property through a privatization agency modeled after Germany's Trojant. Public services such as gas, electricity, railways, water supply and public infrastructure such as ports, airports and motorways, buildings, land, everything has been liquidated. Similar pressures are evident in Portugal, Spain and Italy, although those countries have had ambitious privatization plans uh, the previous decade. We can say that this foreseen and imposed over-exploitation of land, water, coasts, forests, the subsurface and biodiversity constitute acts of violent land dispossession, similar to those we know from the Global South. The Global South is, is coming in Europe to create a South in, 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 the, in the EU. It is interesting that Troika analysts themselves argue that Greece exhibits some delayed mobility of land values. Land and real estate must therefore be normalized 
by following the path of other European countries through privatization, large concentration and curtailing of public and small ownerships, which has been a historical feature of, uh, of socio-economic uh, uh, in Greece. This is an obligatory capitalist modernization. We opposed to this aggressive neoliberal model of growth lies a variety of, of socio-political actors which also try to formulate alternatives. A traditional, let's say, left answer can be called, can be summarized under the title progressive productivism. This is coming from left-leaning socialist and progressive groups. And this approach is based on well-known dependence theories of the capitalist semi-periphery. It claims that historically the domestic productive capacities and comparative advantages for industrial development in, in Greece or in Southern Europe, in other countries of the periphery, have not been uh, exploited uh, for the benefit of the people because of imperialist coercion that blocked development of productive forces and their related prospects for national independence and social emancipation. This long-standing attachment of the left to post-war ideological doctrine of growth and the productivist model has left significant marks even until today. These approaches echo many of the economic and developmental policies followed during the last decade in Latin America by left and progressive governments. They tend to adopt the well-known rationale that we don't produce enough and envision a reconstruction of the economy to be taken over by a broad coalition of the people in general, a unity of national creative forces excluding the few corrupted plutocrats. The progressive productivism approach utilizes the usual panoply of leftist economic responses, capital controls, nationalizations uh, of the banks and of uh, uh, public utilities, price controls, state industrial policy. These left-wing modernizing approaches tend to marginalize qualitative aspects of development, such as the quality of available jobs, and adopt a top-down technocratic spirit while focusing on the nation-state as the par excellence arena of intervention. Environmental concerns remain, of course, subordinated to growth objectives. To give an example, uh, on the holy grail of, uh, of exploiting the gas and oil reserves that supposedly exist under the surface, many left uh, progressives agree and propose to use future revenues to support the social security system as they do in Norway. Other positions that echo a progressive productivism spirit support the full exploitation of domestic brown coal, lignite, to produce cheap energy for the national industry, while they remain skeptic towards the decentralization of developmental decisions. I will now come to what I believe is the real alternative to the dominant neoliberal aggressive policies pursued. Social ecological transformation, uh, as, as, as it's named, uh, comes and other similar alternative ideas emerge from the experience of new forms of social activism developed even since the beginning of 2000 in that global movement, but especially after 2010 in the movement of the squares and the indignados. Although there are, there are already many analyses of these movements, on their character, social composition, divisions, internal, or the visibility of political parties and other organized civil society groups within them, I, I will focus on certain distinct characteristics of them regarding the alternatives they pose 
at first for inclusive and meaningful democracy, and secondly on imperatives they put for human development and well-being. At first, those movements consciously attempted to establish real and direct democratic procedures. They experimented with horizontal forms of internal organization until then used by minor autonomous groups. Radical forms of political engagement appeared, aimed to build a political space here and now. And this was a profound experience for many activists. Since then, hundreds of laboratories for democracy emerged, creating spaces for citizens to experiment with new forms of social organization and democratic decision-making processes. Secondly, and more importantly for the purposes of my presentation, anti-austerity collectives developed at the same time diverse initiatives to set up parallel socio-economic structures. There is a document documentary screening today at 2.30, uh, Another World, and, but, uh, in this conference uh, that illustrates many of those. Uh, those initiatives, those initiatives to set up parallel socioeconomic structures, um, they trace a very different exit strategy from the crisis and show the direction of any future radical political program. Work cooperatives and occupied factories put the issue of self-management in the workplace, economic democracy and collective non-technocratic planning of production. Social clinics and pharmacies that cater for uh, patients without social insurance, which are many, seek at the same time answers on how to build a health system not dominated by medical multinationals. Direct producers to consumers networks and ethical purchasing groups put issues of a fair trade that will bypass intermediaries and the speculative market. Movements against mining activities and polluting investments negate the option of extra extractivism as a way out of the crisis and seek to reevaluate natural and human environments, not narrowly as exploitable assets. Groups against privatizations of land, water, or public infrastructure explore ways of governing the commons away from the market and the capitalist state. Solidarity initiatives against evictions and electricity cuts highlight issues of basic needs, the rights to housing or overcoming energy poverty. <coughs> Groups of young scientists for open source aim to reappropriate new technologies to serve society rather than capitalist control over production and distribution. Social centers and uh, handmade parks, community gardens and open spaces in neighborhoods are defending use values against the marketization of everyday life. Local exchange networks and alternative currencies raise questions of endogenous local development and put issues uh, of negative role uh, of the financial sphere. Voices coming from the orthodox left claim that these experiments lack the critical mass necessary to provide viable alternative models of consumption and production, and that they have little bearing on the big picture, and they cannot seriously challenge the system. But for those who advocate a structural socio-ecological transformation, these forms of, of everyday solidarity and social economy are seen as practices with a radical potential. That is because, as many critics highlight, those initiatives from below adopt either implicitly or explicitly an anti-capitalist or pre-growth stance. Since they refer to structural changes in the political and economic spheres. For example, they provide an immediate response to the needs of those mostly affected by the crisis. And therefore, they prioritize they put priority on the social needs as the essential starting point for any alternative. They provide structures in which people come to see that collective organization and politics, widely defined, can actually change things from today. They put issues of agency for social change, 
the empowerment and active participation of those who are primarily affected by the crisis, the excluded, the have-nots, the working class, if you prefer, is indispensable for any transition strategy. They renegotiate established neoliberal societal values, adopting concepts of good life, simplicity and conviviality. They challenge both production and consumption prototypes of capitalism, posing against, again, the Marxist question on who produces what, for whom and how. Those counter-hegemonic discourses and praxis from below are repoliticizing the debate about what kind of development in what kind of society we want. They can realistically form elements of an alternative approach to public democratic planning and policy away both from neoliberal uh, uh, dogmas and distinct from traditional leftist approaches. Coming to the final part of my presentation, I believe that today in Southern European countries a unique opportunity for democratic socio-ecological transformation is presented. The deep delegitimation of dominant capitalist narratives illustrated by the social movements of the Indignados and the Squares is potentially forming new opposing majorities who are contesting austerity policies while at the same time put on the agenda the issue of radical political change, of completely changing established power structures. This corresponds to the rise of left political forces in Greece and in Spain, and to a lesser extent Italy and Portugal. In Greece, a new radical conception of power, well known in Latin America, instrumental in politics at multiple scales, has been building. It tries to combine conceptions of militant mobilizations around particular issues with a wider radical wing, as the emancipatory subjects try to find their way into the central political game. While social movements and radical events are essential, I propose that they are not enough by themselves. They require transformations in institutions, municipalities, regions, the state and the EU. I believe this is a stake that Syriza is a central part of in Greece, among others. We can trace similar developments in Spain, where new political options, such as Podemos, are entering institutional politics with the ideas and methods that emerged from the squares. Moreover, it is important that those new political forces are adopting advanced ecological claims. In Spain, we saw leading figures of both Podemos and the United Left signing the last call manifesto, which highlights that the economic, political and ecological crisis cannot, overcome, cannot be overcome with the return to old Keynesian policy policies and new cycles of expansion. This is an important uh, position, as it marks a clear departure from certain currents of post-war left. Similarly, similarly, other programmatic declarations of European left parties are putting on the table the urgency of radical economic and social transformation of European society, societies and the paradigm shift. Of course, it is understood that uh, the key word socio-ecological transformation it has become a central political slogan for many uh, people active in the political left, but it is still being understood in very different ways, and there is an ongoing debate among the left uh, how, how this will be uh, translated into a concrete political projects. But uh, I, I propose that radical ecological ideas are infusing radical left parties in Europe. To sum up and draw some conclusions and see some of the many open issues. Countries of South Europe share a lot in common. Capitalist modernization took differentiated paths, and it is because of this historical development that they found themselves in the present conjuncture of the crisis. In socio-economic terms, 
features of southern European countries, such as small and medium ownership, informality, persistence of family <coughs> and local networks, etc., must not be considered anymore as archaic leftovers that need to be eliminated in order for capitalist modernization to finally complete. As Georgos Kalis argues, uh, instead we should build on these elements and other cultural traditions. As Georgos Kalis argues in an article, the historically present in Mediterranean societies, mentalities and ingredients for framing a distinctive model of well-being and the ideas of simplicity, frugality, conviviality, of being in common, may be the secret for a new and inspiring degrowth narrative if we succeed in retrieving and repoliticizing them. In political terms, late democratization, a historically strong role of the state in the formal political sphere, the persistence, even after the collapse of the world, of radical left parties, as well as the democratic experience, experiences of recent anti-austerity movements, may also create favorable conditions for deep changes. To move forward, we need to acknowledge the dead end of one-size-fits-all top-down policies and reject the idea that Southern European countries need to follow the developmental model of the Northern core. Conversely, we must accept that specially differentiated strategies of socio-political actors are required today to overcome the crisis. Especially in Southern European contexts, being, hard by, being hit hard by austerity, the need to create massively quality and socially useful employment and rebuild the social services to alleviate widespread poverty must be addressed urgently and substantially. And this can only be done, I propose, through concerted action by a plurality of socio-political actors and at multiple, multiple scales, not only from bottom-up initiatives, but both from bottom-up initiatives, social initiatives, and with top-down down public policy. Issues of taking the power back from elites and corporations, <coughs> overcoming inequalities, redistribution of existing concentrated wealth, and restoring, in that way, material and symbolic conditions for social justice also must be part of the agenda of radical sociopolitical agents. To push it a little bit further, it might be even that both the social experimentation from below that developed in Southern European countries as a response to the crisis and the political programs that are being developed to unify the have-nots and the impoverished middle strata could become an inspiration for societal change also for the European North. Maybe starting from Greece and elsewhere, we could turn today's neoliberal experiment upside down and the, the radical alternatives of today may become an image from the future of Europe for the whole Europe tomorrow. This is a path that I believe many social movements and political forces pursue today and I believe that we have a long and very interesting uh, struggle ahead of us to, to achieve uh, those aims. Thank you.
because there's still more people coming in the room, there's some free um, places down here. And this event is also streamed in two rooms, HSS3 and HS9. Our second keynote is by Bakram Bakram, and it will build on the Southern European perspective to highlight more generally the vision of degrowth as a concrete utopia that might lead the way out of the multiple crisis we are facing. Barbara is an environmental philosopher and senior scientist at the DFG Collec about post-growth societies at the University of Jena. And from next year onwards, she'll be working as an assistant professor at Oregon State University. She has written many articles and books on degrowth and is working on how to achieve a good life for all in a democratic, solidary and just society beyond growth. And um, she's been involved for many years in the Negro debate, and most importantly, she's also played a key role in organizing this conference. So let's give a warm applause to Barbara's keynote. Effect 
for the socio-economic, political, and cultural reproduction of modern capitalistic societies. Such an imminent dynamic of stabilization has reached the point at which it undermines its own conditions of reproductivity. The growth rates are still uh, the growth rates that are still feasible no longer secure employment, social mobility, and welfare. The promise is over. Moreover, as you all know, being here today, we are faced with external limits to growth. This includes ecological limits on the side of the resources, but also on the side on the side of the things. But also so-called social limits, I think Alberto Costa mentioned that yesterday as well. Due to the satiation of needs, we have to keep creating new artificial needs in order for the economy to keep growing. And also psychological limits to, due to this continuous acceleration and intensification of the pace of life. I wouldn't say that these limits are absolute limits in general to growth. But these limits reduce the profitability of capitalist investments and therefore set the end of easy growth, of easy growth. <laughs> Under the crisis, growth has turned from a means for securing well-being into a goal of its own. Holding on to growth at any cost implies even more expansion in order to push the limits further and extending the capacity to exploit, as Francois Schneider usually says. This means creation of private debt to cover new needs and create even more new needs, increasing even more investments in big infrastructures, the continuous occupation of new territories in literal sense and in metaphorical sense, a new market, like the markets of ecosystem services, and the increasing willingness to take risks, think of fracking, for example. The intensification also means a steady acceleration of social, cultural, and technological innovation, as Harmut Rosa calls it, an overall acceleration of the pace of life, by means of increasing position of competition and the drive to profit accumulation. <laughs> this leads to a dramatic exacerbation of environmental and social conflicts worldwide and to the impairment of the quality of life. Growth is a goal of its own, does not only increase the pressure on the environment, but also jeopardizes democratic stability and social cohesion. Now, does this mean that the end of growth, of, or easy growth, as I say, said before, will come upon us sooner or later as an unavoidable destiny? As many activists, also within the degrowth movement, say, the growth path is doomed to end. Economic shrinking will come upon us and under current conditions, as we have heard, it will aggravate the crisis, leading to increasing impoverishment, recession, inequality, and more social conflicts. Do you remember the bicycle? It will fall down. Would that imply, what would that imply? Degrowth under business as usual conditions. It would mean that we will have to adapt and try to make the best out of it. Especially conservative post-growth analysts, especially in Germany, like the German sociologist Michael Miegel, point out that economic shrinking would mean less tax revenues, obviously, and thus, thus also the shrinking of the welfare state and all its services, and more poverty. Because of, of that, services, especially care-related services, will have to be reallocated to the families and the private sector. Think of care and education. Under these conditions, this is what Miguel says, in order to secure happiness, nevertheless, 
We will need a cultural and awareness shift to non-materialistic value, such as more family relation, spiritual and community values. According to him, also, philanthropic donations would help reducing misery instead of redistribution measures. Such a vision, I think, of a post-Christ society sounds like a step back to pre-modern societies with very high inequality and relatively fixed social roles. You are in a certain place in the society, don't move on from there. Think, for example, of the classic divis division of work between the genders, but also of oppressive patriarchal oppression. Without income ready and wealth redistribution, and without public services, the option of enjoying cultural and spiritual values is open only to those who do not have to work all day and having two or three jobs for making a living, and on top of it, take care of family members in their spare time. Such views serve the business as usual logic. Pacification through voluntary simplicity instead of struggles for the redistribution of wealth and the access to participation. Well, most people present at this conference follow a different path and see in the crisis rather a great chance to start changing things in a more radical way. For them, degrowth is not simply coping with shrinking, but it requires a radical transformation of the basis institutions of our societies in order to render them independent from the growth addiction. If we want to stick with a bicycle example of metaphor, it's time to start working and changing that damn bicycle. When degrowth activists say, your recession is not our degrowth, this is what they mean. Since a growth-based society, which is no longer growing, is doomed to collapse, we are in need of a new vision for a radical transformation of the basic structure of society towards a degrowth path. The challenge now is how to build a just, solidary and democratic society that is no longer dependent on economic growth for its stabilization and legitimation. Now, you have different models on here, like the idea developed by Peter Victor, the Canadian scholar, and he has named his model degrowth uh, by design, right? Yet, I think design is very, designing a different economic is very important. Yet, designing politically a different model with few corrections to the existing one will not be enough. The social transformation needed cannot be the implementation of a particular and specific blueprint. And if, it, if so, I think it will be quite dangerous. But it has to slowly, I would say, I would say fast, emerge from the different forces in our society. <laughs> Degrowth has a very strong potential as a new narrative for catalyzing different drivers, actions, initiatives for social transformation. While degrowth in a literal sense, which comes from ecological economics, means the material reduction of the overall scale of the economy, the colored and heterogeneous group gathering under the idea of degrowth, also here in Leipzig, intended in a wider way. As it is, as uh, French degrowth activists say, a mot au but, a projecting word, a bomb word, that hits like a wedge the very core of modern industrial societies. Growth has been indeed, for decades, the undisputable consensus between the Western and the Soviet bloc. Degrowth hits their contradictions and mode of justification and legitimation. It questions the structure of the economy 
and the cultural infrastructure that justifies it. Therefore, degrowth can play a crucial role in bridging among different groups, approaches, forms of resistance and fights. It can bridge between more antagonistic and more constructive forms of resistance. Take, and as an example, it has been mentioned yesterday, take as an example for an antagonistic movement all the struggles against unnecessarily imposed mega-projects in different European countries, in Germany, for example, Stuttgart, and in Zwanzig. Or, for, as an example for a constructive model of building alternatives, thinks of all the initiatives related to the transition towns, social cooperatives, community-supported agriculture, and the like. Finally, degrowth can offer a platform for dialogue and alliance among different groups fighting the capitalistic mode of production and its logic of exploitation and expansion, such as post-development movements, peasants movements all over the world, but also feminists reclaiming the core role of care against the capitalistic logic, but also artists struggling against the productivistic ideology. We have a lot of artistic intervention at this conference. This is wonderful. Degrowth as a project for societal transformation has the power of becoming a concrete utopia. As the great thinker of utopias, Ernst Bloch, has written, abstract utopia is a mere, merely wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Concrete utopias envision what he calls the real possible, what is already slumbering in the meanders, in the coils, in the folds, of our present world. Concrete utopias anticipate what Bloch calls the real possible, which is possible not only in general, but on the ground of already existing potentials and tendencies that it can unfold and be actualized in the future. Reality is not a flat highway with the, all of signs of Tina, there is no alternative for it. Reality is a complex fabric made of several threads that compose a visible pattern. We are used to see the main pattern and neglect the threads that constitute it. We are used, uh, some of, of these threads are less visible and hidden under the surface. And yet, they are part of the actual world and just wait for being discovered lifted up and woven into new patterns. Concrete utopias require a sense for historical tendencies, which are already existing in the present and can be unfold in the future. However, this does not happen automatically. This is what Bloch calls a militant optimism, not just a naive optimism. Naive optimism is blind with regard to relations of power. Militant optimism means identifying the potentials and tendencies for transformation that are already there and that are hidden, and actively fighting, sizing them, and rendering them visible and stronger, taking them and weaving them actively into new patterns. <coughs> In other words, Concrete utopias challenge the social imaginary of dominant ideologies. No ideology, however dominant, or form of domination, can maintain itself in power without some kind of widespread legitimation. Manipulation, false consciousness alone, would not be enough in the long run. This is why dominant ideologies, including the logic of growth that justifies and legitimizes current institutions and practices in our societies always bear <coughs> a surplus, an overflow of meaning that goes beyond the way in which its basic values are actually realized, interpreted and justified. Each ideology has somehow
to promise a better life to all beyond alienation. This, this surplus of meaning, this overflow of meaning, is the point of leverage for a concrete utopia and entails the seeds for critique and subversion. It rests on already established values that are already widely shared and uses them as the leverage point for enhancing the desire for transformation. Degrowth can represent a shared narrative that can appeal to different forms of discontent and resistance, helping building networks in fruitful alliances. Concrete utopias have both a prefigurative and a performative power. They envision alternative imaginaries by opening spaces for alternatives that are already hidden in the contradiction of the present today. But not only this, more than just envisioning real possible futures, they also embody them in the numerous laboratories in which new spaces are created and protected for actual experimentations and for new experiences. Concrete utopias have the power to transform the social imaginary, as I said. When we speak of social transformation, we have, we have to keep in mind that we have different dimensions of social transformation. I am just focusing here on the social imaginary. I think Harris has focused much more on the first one, which is the structural and the institutional level of social transformation. But we cannot do everything. So the social imaginary is not just a cultural dimension of our societies. It, it is the set of deep beliefs, established values, the collective self-understanding of a society that keeps that very society together. Because of our common and shared social imaginary, our practices and actions make, make sense to us and to others. Like if you go and put a cross on a sheet of paper and put it into a box and you have the shared social imaginary that you live in a democracy, this action makes sense. If you do it in a different place, in a different setting, it doesn't have the same sense, right? The social imaginary justifies what we do in society in the face of others, conveys social recognition and sometimes also disapprobation. When Serge Latouche says that the first step towards degrowth is the decolonization of the imaginary, he implicit, implicitly thinks of this complex set of meanings that legitimizes society. Now, how can the social imaginary be transformed and changed? Crises offer a great opportunity for transformation, as we have seen. When what we do does no longer correspond to the legitimate expectations we had so far, we start questioning the legitimation background. Collective meaning does no longer work, institutions and practices as well, as otherwise accepted values lose their credibility for us. The promise of growth for increasing well-being does no longer work for many people at least for those for whom it had worked before, which is mainly members of the middle class, but not all. The perspective of climbing the social ladder turned into a dead end within the crisis. The mythology of merit, you work hard and you get to something, has also vaporized into an increasing intensification of pressure and performances. Growth, growth also does no longer guarantee employment, or at least no employment that allow, allows us a dignified living. For, for transforming the social imaginary, we do not need brand new values. As I said before, established values carry in themselves an overflow of meaning that can be explored and developed into new perspectives. Think, for example, of values like freedom or autonomy in the Western countries. They are taken to mean individual freedom and arbitrariness in shaping one's 
own personal lifestyle, in full independence from the surrounding people or the environment, just like the fish of the picture, independent from the water. And yet, the very idea of autonomy bears in itself the potential for the understanding of collective autonomy as a political concept, in which being rooted and embedded in relations and responsibilities is not a limit, but its very condition. The only present value of autonomy can be re-signified to mean, for example, reclaiming, claiming back the capacity to decide about the conditions of our common living and not only about our lifestyles. Social imaginaries also change through social struggles for emancipation, think of the feminist movement, or against discrimination, think of, of the LGBT, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual movement. Social societal experiments can be the leverage for transforming the shared imaginary. They anticipate future possibilities and already contribute to create a space in which this possibility can be experienced, <coughs> lived, and tested. Um, I wanted to show a few examples. We are all familiar with this, these examples, but just to have a sense of what I mean when I say that prefigurative social experiments can contribute to change the social imaginary. Think of the shape of our cities. We live in times in which, due to the dogma of efficiency, space is organized in terms of a strict separation between urban and rural areas, between work and life, between production and consumption. Efficient in this is, is this model only under the premise of mass production and mass consumption. Otherwise, it is the most inefficient model you could think of in which the exploitation of one part is the condition for the survival of the other. Cities can become spaces, instead, in which food is produced, energy generated, and even resources are obtained if you think of all the materials that are in your smartphones, computers, and other home devices. This requires a new form and spaces for interaction that enable sharing, reducing the amount of surface used for living and sustaining life, decentralizing food and energy production and services, while at the same time guaranteeing cooperation and networks for solidarity. We do witness many experiments on the side of reducing consumption by sharing. However, the more radical shift we need in order to change our imaginary about cities is a step from collaborative consumption to collabor collaborative production, as it is fostered, for example, by self-managed cooperatives. The transformation of towns and cities does not only concern people in the global north and is not only a project for middle-class lovers. Just the opposite. We can learn quite a deal from the coping strategies of the poor everywhere in the world in terms of their struggles for self-determination. Take the example of some favelas and their self-managed structure. Planners coming from the outside and importing new models for development, for development might have great, great new ideas, but will reach nothing if they do not understand that the change has to be implemented, conceived and supported by those who are primarily involved and know their situation much better. The idea behind the transition style movement here is a radical rethinking of cities, their function, and their meaning. I think that what is really important in the transi transition style movement is their attention to, to plurality, local expertise and potentials, participation and networking. And it opens a new space for real experiences. Um, second example, you have heard a lot yesterday from Zilke about the commons and common movement. It said, it, this is about the newer radical thinking of production and sharing that implies the use of what Illich called convivial technologies. 
If you think of projects like, like the open source ecology, which is based on the cooperation of people in creating small machines that can be used, for example, in agriculture, by local communities, and thus render a simple life more comfortable. As Silke has said yesterday, the Commons movement is not about a, self, a shared and self-organized management of common goods and resources. It embodies a different mode of living relations that are not reduced to merely instrumental relations. Technology becomes convivial if it is rescued from the illusory idea that it is just a neutral means to our goals. Common it means to reclaim the meaning of another meaning of technology is convivial technology for the common good. And I could give other examples about solidarity economy and a bunch, bunch of other things, but I'm moving on to my last part. There is a critique against lots of these initiatives, and is that they are just small scale niches. Some of them are. This is often. I'm sorry. And I disagree. I disagree that it's only small scale niches. I do not think that what matters is uh, how to scale them up. In some cases it might make sense, but in most cases I don't think the scaling small niches up is the way to go. In fact, most of the time, such experiments work very well at the local level, at the small scale level, and they lose their meaning and their transformative power if they're generalized. Rather, I think the social experiments can become places where people are empowered against all these teen analytics, there is no alternative narratives. These are laboratories where social innovation is literally forged, and where people participating in them can find the power and the motivation for resisting, building alliances, and continue the transformation in other areas of life. And they can prepare themselves for struggles, we need to know how it feels to live differently, <coughs> otherwise we cannot figure it out. This is why I think that concrete utopias are spaces in which we can collectively relearn to desire. Learn collectively about what our desires and not the preferences of, of economists are. In such laboratories for the future, we have the chance of provisionally suspending and starting to question pseudo-desires and the satisfaction of needs imposed by the existing structures. Here we can start a collective learning process about needs, desires, and what it means to live well together. <coughs> Instead of an intellectual debate about what right and false needs are, in social experiments, a process of liberation can take, take, can take place to which everybody has access and where experience, and not only theories, play a major role. Participation and diversity of perspectives are essential for a process of education of design. It is about learning to desire differently, to desire better, and yes, to desire more and not less. And I'm concluding. Yes, desire more than what we have access to today. As uh, Ivan Illich, the great critique of development, writes, in contemporary industrial societies, humans are driven into a drug addiction-like state. This is why our desires are shrink. In which people lose their autonomy, which is for Illich the capacity to creatively deal with problems and find solutions adequate to the context. And people are then delivered to the systemic and technical forces of the development machine. This is one of my favorite quotes. I read it. Prisoners in rich countries 
often have access to more things and services than members of their families outside the prison. But they have no say in how things are to be made and cannot decide what to do with them. They are degraded to the status of mere consumers. Economic growth has secured for a large amount of people a fairly good life in material terms for a long time. Consumption has thus replaced political debates about the conditions for a good life by strengthening the illusion of freedom of options. But this is a shrinking desire. And thus, consumption has numbed our capacity to desire better and desire more. Education of desire is a common project, is a common learning process, means also education to autonomy as a, sorry, I read it again. Education of desire is a common learning process, means also education to autonomy as a collective project. It means giving us collectively the limits that we have chosen, instead of having the conditions for the common living imposed from by some kind of indisputable belief, such as economic growth or, this, or, or a self-regulating global market. In order to start a serious debate about needs and desires, we need protected areas where we can experience, test, and critically discuss alternatives. From there, we can then start reclaiming and regaining control over and transforming the framework conditions for a good life for all. Thank you very much.